hello, and welcome to the Hafey Digital. No, wow, that was a Freudian slip. It's the uh, the Creative Control Room podcast pre-show, formerly Hafey Digital podcast. And this is the part of the show where we go around and make sure that all systems are go. So if you're new here, we go through and uh, look over a bunch of different things. <clears throat> First thing we look at uh, OBS, which is on a screen here that you can't see off camera. Uh, and we make sure that our audio levels are coming through, making sure that there are no drop frames, no drop frames currently. We make sure that we are streaming and recording. Uh, we go and make sure that uh, everything is live where it's supposed to be. So today we and every week we are streaming on YouTube, we are streaming on Facebook, we are streaming on Twitter, and we are streaming on Twitch. And it appears that everything is up where it needs to be. Fantastic. Good. See my audio coming through. Recording here on the Roadcaster. <clears throat> uh, let's check our camera angles. Actually, this one. So this one looks a little bit different, and you'll see why once we get into the show. Bring this one down a little bit. There we go. Cool. That's camera two. Uh, what else? Let's see. Double check our. Animations looks like those are working as well. Fantastic. Oh, one thing I forgot to bring up here is my restream chat. I haven't seen a Twitch notification yet. But let's see. Digital.com. Really? You're going to make me do a... Let's see. Boom. Verify. There's Twitch. All right, cool. Up and running there. Fantastic. <clears throat> I always feel like I'm forgetting something. What am I forgetting today? Am I forgetting something? We're recording everywhere. We're streaming. Audio looks good. Cameras are good. Everything's good. I think we're all right. <clears throat> okay, cool. This is episode number two, or two, 92 for Sunday, September 12th. And uh, let's just go ahead and get into this, shall we? Hello and welcome to episode number 92 of the Creative Control Room Podcast, a show for creators, makers, and doers. Where my goal is to help you make to the max. Wait, is this camera on? Yeah, it is. Oh, that's right. I turned the screen on. <laughs> I'm your operator, Ryan Hafey. And in this episode, uh, we're talking about different ways to achieve perfect exposure. Let's roll that official, unofficial intro. Do a different one here. Gotta, I really got to update that. Um, that intro is bad. I had a couple ideas for some intros that uh, that I wanted to um, animate, and it's going to look very different from that one. I just got to find the time to get in here and, and, and do it. Um, I want to make it look cool, but I don't, uh, don't want to go too crazy with it, so... Still kind of poking around some ideas in my head. So in the meantime, that's what we're going to continue to work with, even though it's not uh, it's not exactly the coolest. So anyway, um, right off the top, let's go ahead and get into some updates for the week. Uh, and actually, this week was a relatively um, simple week, not too much going on. Although I did, uh, did have a procedure on Friday, which has kept me pretty much on the couch for the last couple days and just taking it easy. Um, uh, I had full disclosure, I had a vasectomy. So I have three kids, three great kids. I'm 36 years old and, uh, it was time. So <laughs> I have been recovering from that for the last couple of days. Should be back up and running at full steam by the end of the week or so. But yeah, there's that. The other thing is, uh, I've been streaming a little bit more on Twitch exclusively. So this podcast currently is being streamed on Twitch but also I figured, you know, I'm, I mentioned this last week as well, but I'm doing a lot of uh, flight simulation flying, um, like in liftoff and in Velocidrone. So I figured, hey, as long as I'm doing that anyway, and I already have the setup and everything ready to go, might as well, you know, when I get on uh, and, and practice my drone flying in the simulator, might as well stream it on Twitch and talk a little bit about FPV as well. So if you're into that, and uh, if you like FPV, if you like 
FPV drone flying or just kind of see, want to see what, you know, what I, what I do and, and how it works and what it looks like, just, uh, you know, follow me in, on Twitch. Uh, I don't really have a set schedule for that. Not really putting a ton of effort into it at this point, just more or less having some fun with it, seeing if anybody pops in to watch. But uh, yeah, streaming on Twitch every now and then. So check that out. Um, by the way, because we skipped this part already, if you are new to the show, my name is Ryan Hafey. This is a creative control room podcast. And uh, this is where, um, this is my creative control room. This is where I do kind of all my creative work and talk about any projects that I happen to be working on, everything related to cameras, video, photography, uh, you know, gear, FPV, podcasting, live streaming, exposure, as we're going to talk about today. So if you're into any of that, or if any of that sounds interesting to you, feel free to hit that subscribe button wherever you happen to be watching or listening, and follow me on social media, at Ryan Hafey, uh, on basically everywhere, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Uh, give me a follow, send me a note, say what's up. And uh, let's have a conversation after this is all said and done. So anyway, so that was the updates for the week. Let's talk a little bit about news now. So really only one thing came across my radar this week that I thought was interesting enough to talk about. And that is um, YouTube's recent announcement that they are going to be... Pull it up here. I don't want that yet. Let's see. There we go. <clears throat> so YouTube announced recently that they are going to be doing something that is going to benefit a lot of smaller creators. In this case, they are going to be moving the goalpost or the requirements for how many subscribers you need to have in order to use the community tab um, from 1,000 down to 500 starting October 12th. So if you don't ha have that 1,000 subscribers yet, but you have over 500, you will be able to utilize the community tab. And just in case you're not aware, the community tab is, is essentially where you can go and just kind of post like you would to like Facebook or really any other social network. You can go there and post a photo or just a quick update. You can post polls and things like that. And what I've noticed, this is the, the uh, super um, visually appealing blog post from Google, by the way, we'll zoom in a little bit here in case you want to read what's on the screen. But um, what I've noticed when it comes to YouTube in that community tab is that, uh, especially if you have a a good following on YouTube, the amount of uh, engagement I've seen on some of those posts, not necessarily only from my channels, but you know, from brand accounts that I've used, the engagement you can get on some of those posts is actually a lot higher than you might see elsewhere. It's really interesting. So if you have access to the community tab and you haven't used it yet uh, and you're looking to try to grow your channel, the community tab is a great way to do that. It's a great way to drive more traffic back to your videos. It's a great way to engage with your subscribers and using the polls and all that kind of stuff. So um, if you're on YouTube, try to kind of diversify how you use the platform. If, you know, if you're only producing longer form videos, try using the community tab more, try creating more shorts, really get into the different types of um, uh, tools that they have to offer and uh, play around with that a little bit and see how it can benefit you and your YouTube, uh, your YouTube journey. So that was interesting. Um, yeah. And, and they also mentioned that they will lower the requirements further, uh, going forward. So for now, starting October 12th, they're lowering it to 500 subscribers, but going forward, uh, it sounds like they may be opening it up, opening it up to everyone. So interesting to take note of. <clears throat> I'm still dealing with like some remnants of of this cold that I'm still getting over. So if you hear me clearing my throat every now and then, that's what it is. Thought I'd spare you that cough there. Okay. Um, so those were the updates for the week. And we're going to just go right in to the main topic for the week because um, after this, I have some sushi to go eat. And I'm very excited about that because it's been a while <laughs> since I've had some sushi. But uh, we're not going to run through this. We're going to take our time on it because it's important. And the main topic that we are getting into today is how to uh, achieve perfect exposure on your cameras. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. You'll see different, you know, different people um, suggesting different methods. Now, what we will not be talking about, or at least in depth in this episode, is how to achieve 
perfect exposure um, on your camera. I have other videos, and I don't think it's in the description yet, but after the show, I will go and find a previous episode where I break down the exposure triangle. Um, and you can kind of, you know, if you're looking for more of that type of information, you can you can watch that and uh, get a better handle on that from, from that video. But what I want to talk about in this particular video is different ways that you can kind of measure your exposure and make sure that what you're seeing on the back of the camera is, is, is a properly exposed image. So let's jump right into these different exposure mes me methods. The first one is going to be uh, your, a, a light meter, your camera's light meter, your, you know, most digital cameras these days have a built-in light meter, or you can even buy a separate light meter. Uh, a lot of photographers like to use those, especially with flash photography. I don't even currently own a, a light meter. Um, but I will use a camera light meter every now and then. And we're going to refer to this, uh, this, uh, camera angle a few for a little bit during this episode. Reason being, I guess I'll have to turn this way. Uh, I was able to turn on the display so you can kind of see what's on the screen uh, and the different values on there. So what you will see, first of all, if you look, let me see, you see a, a few different values on the bottom here, right there is your shutter speed. And then moving over, this is your aperture. And then this is, this is kind of like the light meter. This is telling you how over or under exposed you are based on your current exposure settings with, within your camera. Like you might have center weighted exposure, spot metering, whatever it may be. Um, typically speaking, by default, I use just a um, uh, full, you, I forget what it's called, but the exposure meter, it's, it's, it's ex exposing for the entire frame, not spot metering, but it's looking at the entire frame and gauging the exposure off of that. And there's a reason why it's hovering between plus 1.7 and plus two, which we will get into that in a little bit, but, <clears throat> And in my case, this works for what I'm doing, but this would be your, like your in-camera light meter. So if you were trying to expose for a scene, uh, you could utilize that to, uh, s according to the camera to figure out the light that's coming in, is it currently exposed properly? Um, it's not always going to be foolproof. It's not always going to work well. By the way, this is obviously ISO on the, on the, uh, the end there. Um, so we'll come back here for a little bit. So it's not going to work for every scene, and there are some. There are going to be some exceptions for that. Obviously, uh, one exception is what I just showed you, which uh, it was overexposed, and I will talk about why that happens. Um, but uh, what, like for example, when I shoot boxing photography, when I'm exposing for boxing photography, typically speaking, there are these bright lights up top. And they're shining bright on the fighters, but everything around the fighters and in the stands and everything is going to be dark. So typically speaking, if I'm if I'm trying to expose to shoot boxing photography, using that is not going to be a good measure of that because there's going to be a lot of dark coming in and only a little bit of light coming, you know, bouncing off the fighters. So if you have a nice, well-lit scene, you could probably use something like that if everything's pretty evenly lit. But I wouldn't rely on that exclusively because, again, like I said, it will vary depending on your your uh, lighting situation. The let's minimize this for now. The uh, the next one is the histogram. So we're going to go back to this angle here. So this is your histogram, and I would argue that this is probably the most reliable way for gauging uh, exposure. If you have access to it, your camera, if you have a modern digital camera, it should uh, give you a histogram to look at. And you usually just have to cycle through your display settings in order to find it. But what a histogram does is it's going to, it basically shows you the distribution of bright and dark areas in your scene. So what you can see here on mine is there's kind of a, there's a little bit of a gap here at the bottom and that could, that's, um, Basically, yeah, so at the bottom of the histogram, at this side of the histogram, this is this is not very illustrative. Actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to change this. We're going to go back here, and I'll go here, and we're going to bring this back up. Should I lie? Let's go camera two. Why not? So this is going to be, these are just a bunch of different examples of histograms. So let's open one of these up, and you can just kind of see. Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't want no, get rid of that. Okay. So 
blow this up a little bit. So histogram is going to show you the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. Now you might think that you want to have an even distribution across from left to right in order for it to be considered perfectly exposed, but you would be wrong depending on where, you know, again, your current situation. So imagine you're outside, it's a bright sunny day, there's a lot of harsh contrast, so there's going to be a lot of really bright areas, and then in the shadows there's going to be a lot of really dark areas. If that was the case on this histogram, what you would see is a buildup on the shadows and then maybe a dip in the midtone areas and then uh, a buildup again on the highlights because again, lots of bright parts, lots of dark, part, dark parts, not a lot, not a ton in the midtones. Versus if you were, let's say you were outside and it was a cloudy day um, and a cloudy day is going to make the light that's hitting the, the ground much softer so you're going to not have nearly as much contrast, which means this histogram is going to look a lot more even from left to right. There's going to be a lot more in the midtones, and then the shadows and highlights are going to be toned down. So you kind of have to understand the scene that you're in in order to understand how the histogram is going to uh, work for you. But just keep, take note of that. If I was in, if I was shooting boxing, I would be looking for a histogram that's probably loaded heavily on the shadow side, again, because most of what's gonna come in the frame is likely going to be shadows, and then uh, kind of a big drop off maybe, you know, halfway through the midtones, and then not much going from, you know, the halfway mark up. And, uh, you know, not a whole lot of pixels, not a whole lot of bright pixels in the scene, so you're gonna see a big drop off there. Um, if you're in a very bright scene or if you're working with like a big white background of some kind, you will see a lot of buildup on the highlight side and maybe less or less or less so on the shadow side. But what you don't want, you obviously want the histogram to be to, sh to be ref reflective of the situation that you're in, but you also don't want your histogram, you know, if let's use the white background example. If you have if you're shooting on a bright white background, you do want everything to be shifted to the right of the histogram, but you don't want it to be so far to where it clips all the way to the right side because the more you have pushed off to either side of the histogram, you're potentially losing some detail in those areas. You're crushing those areas. So you don't want everything all the way pushed up against the left side where the shadows are or the right side where the highlights are because you want to make sure you're retaining value. And obviously, too, you don't want to be just looking at the histogram. Look at your histogram, look at your monitor or the back of your camera to make sure that you're not actually blowing out the highlights. But what I would suggest is get really familiar with using the histogram because it's going to give you a much more accurate depiction of your current exposure. Um, and it's, it's definitely going to work better than the light meter because, again, the light meter is just going to look at your entire scene and try to base exposure off of that. But it's not the light meter in your camera is not going to take into account the situation that you're in. It's not going to know if you're shooting in a dark environment intentionally or if you're shooting in daylight or in contrast, whatever. It doesn't matter. So the histogram kind of gives you that extra level of protection there, I guess you could say. So that's the histogram. Get familiar with it. Use it. Um, another thing that you can use, <clears throat> maybe you aren't super familiar with the histogram or whatever it may be, uh, you can use zebras. And zebras are available in most, um, well, at least in the Sony cameras, I know for sure. I don't know. I imagine it's probably pretty standard these days for most camera makers. But zebras, at least with when it comes to... Here, let's do this. Let's see if we can make this happen. So in the Sony a7 III, for example, you can set different zebra zones. So... Uh, Basically, you can tell the camera to alert you when your highlights reach a certain level. So maybe it's 90%, maybe it's a 95, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 100 plus. I think those are the different options that it gives you. And what it'll do is on the back of your camera, it will show you these black and white zebra stripes where the highlights have reached those certain indicators. So let's see, I'm just going to crank up the ISO on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crank up the ISO on this and see if we can get these zebras to come through. So here you go. My my uh, ISO is super high. And let me go to the right camera angle here. There you go. So you can kind of see on the back how I have all these striped lines. Now, if I bring the exposure down or if I bring my ISO down, you can start to see them go away. 
because the exposure is kind of becoming more accurate. But the more I raise up the exposure, now you see the zebras. And you don't want to see too many of those zebras. You might want to see a little bit, just so, you know, dep again, depending on how you have it set. If you have your highlights zebra set to, to appear at 95%, then that means you, when you start to see those stripes, you've got about a 5% buffer. So maybe you set it up to where you set it at 95% so that you can start to see those zebras and know, okay, now I need to stop increasing my exposure. Um, I think I typically have mine on 100 plus, I think. But basically, it's a safeguard to keep you from overexposing and losing a lot of detail in those highlights because if you blow out your highlights, then you can't retrieve that data you can't you know just you can't just open it up and color grade it and, and recover those highlights so you want to it's just kind of an extra layer a layer of protection but if you typically expose to your highlights zebras are a good avenue so that's that's a uh, method number three method number four is using an exposure card <clears throat> now there are exposure cards and there are gray cards 18 percent gray cards um or sorry, there are there are white balance cards and there are exposure or eighteen percent gray cards. White balance cards, they're they're very similar and a lot of people I think use them interchangeably or discuss them interchangeably, but they're a little bit different. White balance cards are basically, do I have one? Like this this little color checker has a little white balance card inside of it, which in this case, you know, it looks like this, and you can use your camera. Uh, cameras white balance features and use this as a way to make sure that your colors are going to be accurate. But this is not an 18% gray card. 18% gray is going to be a little bit darker, but you can use your camera's light meter in conjunction with an exposure card uh, and find exposure that way. So you would place an exposure card and usually they can they make them in these pop-up ones. They'd be like, you know, a foot in diameter or something like that. You would place it in your scene where your lighting is and make sure that it's kind of, you know, being properly uh, exposed or, you know, the, the lighting it's, it's in the, in the scene where, where your subject is going to be, where you want to be, want to properly expose. So for me, I would put an exposure card right here and then I would use the light meter on the back of the camera to make sure that I've zeroed out my exposure. So the light meter, this would typically, would, would you would want this to be zero because that would mean that it's not overexposed or underexposed. So exposure cards are essentially there to, yeah, just help you dial in that exposure based on your lighting. Um, I don't use them. I, I think if you really want to really dial it in, you know, maybe for a, a bigger production or something like that, they, it might be more helpful. But that's just another way that you can do it. So exposure cards, you can find them on Amazon. You can find them all over the place. Check that out. <clears throat> Um, next is this one's more photography related, but, uh, you can bracket your shots. So if you, uh, this is, this is also used commonly in HDR or like land, you know, high definition or, um, high dynamic range, sorry, or, you know, for like landscapes, uh, or if you're in a very high contrast environment and you want to, you don't, you don't want to lose any of your detail in the darks or in the bright parts of the image. So bracketing your shots essentially will take multiple shots at different exposures. So you might, one might be a little bit underexposed or maybe one will be exposed for the highlights. One will be kind of properly exposed and then one will be exposed for the shadows. And then you can bring those into a program like Lightroom or something like that, merge them together. And then you kind of get the best of all three. So you're, you're exposing for basically everything versus taking one perfectly exposed shot and then trying to, you know, bump those shadows or bring down those highlights in post. So yeah, uh, try bracketing. Um, it's different how it works, I believe from camera to camera, but, uh, usually there's, um, a setting in there that will allow you to bracket your shots. And even if there's not, you can just do it manually, uh, put your phone or camera on a tripod, um, take one shot under exposed, one properly exposed and one overexposed merge them in Lightroom and see what you get out of that. And then the last method for achieving perfect exposure is going to be just by eye. And obviously this takes practice and it's not always easy to know what's properly exposed just by looking at the back of the camera. I can't tell you how many times. And it also depends too, like if you're using picture profiles and things like that, 
Um, picture profiles can make things a little bit different or difficult, more difficult to expose, especially if you're using like a log. <clears throat> but uh, really just comes down to experience and kind of um, understanding how your camera works and understanding exposure. So if you've got enough experience using all those other method methods I've mentioned, zebras, histogram, all of that, after a while, you kind of get a good idea of what a proper exposure looks like. Um, but it does, it takes time to practice in different scenarios, you know, um, you know, event photography, shooting outside landscapes, sports photography, whatever it is, you kind of have to go through the reps and go through the motions of those different scenarios to understand what is properly proper exposure in those. And, um, just a little bit of trial and error, but eventually you can get it. And, uh, some people do it. I think, um, Cody blue, I think I saw a video of his a while ago where he talks about, um, he just exposes by eye. So it all, it all kind of depends. And those zebras too, uh, as I mentioned earlier, zebras are effective in helping with kind of that, with uh, finding exposure based on just kind of using your eye. Um, so there you go. That's uh, just to kind of recap those. One, a camera, your camera's light meter or just a, a separate light meter. Two is using a histogram. That's probably the most preferred and most accurate way to get uh, exposure. Uh, three, use your camera's zebra highlight feature. Four, use an exposure card of some kind if you really want to dial it in. Uh, five, use shot, uh, use bracketing. Uh, again, this works really only for photography, not so much for video, but you can use bracketing. And lastly, just use your eye. Uh, trust your instincts and use your eye. Now, a couple notes that I do want to mention in regards to all of this. Uh, the first thing is going to be perfectly exposed, quote unquote, is going to differ based on your stylistic choices. Um, you know, you might want to underexpose something intentionally if you're shooting uh, what should be a night scene, but also <clears throat> based on your picture profiles. If you use picture profiles in your camera, some picture profiles function better when exposed differently. So going back over into this camera here, you can see that the light meter kind of goes back and forth between 1.7 and 2 uh, overexposed. And the reason for that is because I use an S-Log2 picture profile. And S-Log2, typically speaking, works best when you overexpose. So if my understanding with, S with, with Log profiles is a lot of the data is kind of stored more in the highlights area of um, of the, of the histogram, I guess. Um, and log profiles are very low contrast. So when you film in a log profile and also very low, low saturation, but, um, from an exposure standpoint, low contrast is what's important. So instead of, you know, if you have a histogram, instead of a histogram where everything goes from one side to the next, and it's kind of evenly distributed, typically speaking, a log is going to uh, kind of just right, you know, like in in a small section, all of the data is going to be be compressed into a small portion of that histogram, and then that gives you the flexibility to then stretch that out. Versus if you have a picture profile that's already capturing kind of the full dynamic range, typically speaking, you run the risk of uh, clipping either your highlights or crushing your blacks in that case. And it makes it harder to recover those. So with the data, kind of all of your picture data more in the center gives you flexibility to play around and do more with those highlights in those dark areas. And you, and you're at a lower risk of losing data in those areas. So, um, so yeah, if you're using a, if you're shooting in a log profile, you're going to typically overexpose. Um, I can't honestly think Actually, you know, I think I've heard of people uh, underexposing slightly when using like Cine 2 or Cine 4 picture profiles, talking specifically for Sony. Um, but uh, yeah, de depending on the picture profile you use, just kind of look it up, do a little bit of research, see uh, and see kind of what people recommend as far as uh, properly exposing. But anytime I shoot on the picture profile that I use and my picture profile of choice is uh, S-Log2, with the ITU 709 matrix color mode, uh, cause it adds in a little bit more saturation than, than just a standard S log profile. 
So in that case, I typically overexpose by 1.7 to 2, um, and it gives me the results that I like. In fact, this camera also shoots on that. You can see there's a lot of exp or a lot of contrast in this image. Uh, that's because I was able to create a LUT that that makes it look like this. But just something to keep in mind there. Also, uh, another note: use manual exposure. Don't attempt to use, especially when shooting video. You don't want to use uh, an auto mode of any kind. <clears throat> Reason being, if let's say somebody opens a window or maybe turns on a light or whatever it may be, or you just turn the camera to in a direction where there's more light coming from, your camera is going to compensate and it's going to change your exposure uh, as you're filming. And that's tough to fix in post. So try to find an exposure that's going to work for your situation and stick with that manually set all you know your iso your aperture and your shutter speed set that all manually so that you can lock that in and avoid any exposure fluctuate fluctuations from your camera uh, any automatic exposure fluctuations now if you're in a situation where you need to adjust your exposure as you're filming let's say you're going from inside to outside or whatever it may be um, there are a couple things you can do to make to make sure that your camera is adjusting for that exposure gradually. Um, the first would be uh, use uh, try using like a, a, an ND filter. So I don't have one with me today, but you, know, you could use like an adjustable ND filter. I have the the Peter McKinnon Polar Pro two to five stop ND filter, and that's great. Um, <laughs> Nabil uh, is in the chat. Nabil, I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, anyway, um, so if you're, yeah, the the two the the adjustable ND filters are great because they're not clicked, meaning you can just kind of smoothly trans uh, transition them. So if you're going, let's say, from inside to outside, you can crank up the stops on that and slowly and kind of gradually and evenly change the exposure or change the amount of light that's coming into the camera. The other thing you can do is find a lens like one of these. <clears throat> this is a uh, just kind of a cheap cinema lens, but it has a an aperture ring that is smooth versus uh, hold on. Actually, this doesn't have an aperture ring on it, but if you have a camera that has an aperture ring on it, it may or may not um, be clicked to where it sounds, brrr. oh no, you know what I have, hold on, there we go. So let's see if I can make this sound. So this is this is the uh, um, 135 millimeter from Sony and this has clicked and unclicked uh, aperture. So with it clicked, it sounds like, but if you turn off the click, it now sounds like, uh, like this can't hear it and that's good that means that you can kind of change the exposure smoothly or change your aperture smoothly which is going to change your exposure smoothly um, and if you have clicked on it's going to kind of stop it's going if you change your exposure it's going to look like it's sort of ticking into each different exposure setting but if you have a non-clicked exposure or aperture then you can kind of very smoothly transition that exposure so some things to consider some things to think about uh, when it comes to exposure. But there you go. Those are my tips for achieving perfect exposure for your videos and also occasionally for your photos. Uh, if you found that interesting or helpful at all, it would be great if you could hit that subscribe button wherever you happen to be watching or listening. Also, follow me on social media at Ryan Hafey on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And uh, feel free to swing by, say hello, and uh, or ask a question or whatever whatever floats your boat. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and call this one done. So thank you so much for being here. Keep on creating, making, and doing. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Feel free to swing by, say hello. And, uh, or ask a question or whatever, whatever floats your boat. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and call this one done.